We're kicking off winter here in the Sea to Sky, and it's so nice to cozy up with a warm drink, a glass of wine, or a hearty, delicious meal. These shorter, darker days mean more time spent at home, so I think everyone will agree it's the perfect time of year to indulge a little bit. You can easily twist my rubber arm when it comes to good food, good wine, and good company, so let's go explore the Sea to Sky's way to tingle the taste buds on today's Where You Live. I'm a self-professed coffee, food, and wine lover, and I think we're pretty lucky here in the Sea to Sky because we get some very talented and creative people that come to the area that work in the hospitality industry. I'm in downtown Squamish at 1914, and I'm with the owner, Mike, who is a coffee professional. Thanks for joining me today. So I hear that you are out there trying to change the perception of coffee, one coffee at a time. How are you trying to do that? Sure. I, uh, for the most part, um, when dealing with either a customer who's in my shop for a drink or for customers looking for beans, I try and assess what their preference is and usually use tools like asking them what the worst coffee experience they've had is. Mm -hmm. And then that way I can, at the very least, not give them what they had had that was terrible, right? Be it a, was it either too light or too dark, too acidic, too sweet, whatever it was. There's a lot of complaints that people often have about coffee and being able to find the one that they like and either make that drink repeatedly well for them or find the beans for them that they like, then that gives you a long-term customer. So. And you know, we live in this world full of pumpkin spice lattes and things like that. What's your take on those kinds of drinks? I, you know, I mean, in the specialty coffee industry, as it were, they tend to kind of say no to a lot of those things. Kind of they see that as the sort of the Starbucks part of things. Um, and for me, I, I kind of feel like I've got a door that's open to the public and I'm gonna get people of all walks of life walking through. And if somebody's accustomed to going somewhere like Starbucks and getting pumpkin spice, I feel pretty, I'm bothered when I would have had to say no to them. So I have not pumpkin spice, but pumpkin pie syrup, so. Pumpkin pie syrup, yeah, that's so. a nice way of handling yeah, it. it. works. The landscape of the coffee industry here in Squamish and the Sea to Sky, how have you seen that changed over the years? Because you've been doing this for a really long time in the area. Yeah, I started with uh, Galileo Coffee in 2007, so it's been 10 years. And they'd been at it for just about a year when I started with them. And prior to that, there wasn't much more than being around the world up in Brackendale. With them, I saw a, a pretty big surge of locals really appreciating um, a new place to get drinks on their way into the city or their way back, or more so people having beans for home. And that, that's really what set in for me and allowed me to um, focus as much on providing drinks as providing beans for people because there's a reasonable amount of money in wholesale and coffee, so kind of mm -hmm. recognized where the primary source of their uh, their income came from. So, and since then, we've got cafes like Zephyr and The Ledge, and I even briefly worked at uh, Cloudburst Cafe when they first started. And with more and more cafes uh, opening up in town, it's giving more people more options. I heard that you actually carry quite a lot of different coffees, and you bring them in from all over the sure. world, all sorts of specialty beans. Do you want to tell me about a couple of them? Sure. Um, I've got one here that is, um, this is from a Australian roaster out of uh, Canberra, uh, and so that's the uh, capital city of Australia. The owner of that company is also um, an owner of a green coffee sourcing entity known as Project Origin. And he recently went to India and developed a project to work with farmers that would have at best been able to attain commodity level prices for their coffee, which is about just over $2 a pound green for the coffee, which if you saw how long it takes somebody to harvest enough coffee cherries to make that much uh, green coffee, you'd be shocked at how little money that really amounts to. So mm -hmm. um, what they did was they taught them a few methods that they've employed in various other countries involving a refractometer known as a BRICS meter that allows them to assess the sugar content of the coffee cherry, much like with what wine producers have done for years. Um, it's enabled coffee producers to increase the overall sweetness in the cup of coffee, which the average Joe doesn't even necessarily understand that coffee can have sweetness because they don't necessarily realize that it's a fruit from a, a tree that's, you know, it's not a bean as we call it, it's actually the seed of a cherry, right? So this one in particular, because they've processed it naturally, which means they've left the seed inside the coffee cherry rather than removing that before processing, and it's allowed the fruit sugars inside of the coffee cherry to 
impart themselves onto the seed. And then when a roaster carefully um, crafts a roast with that, you can't go too far with it because if you roast it too dark, you're going to basically uh, mask those flavors. But mm -hmm. in this case, it has a lot of flavors that are reminiscent of fruit. So, and India is not particularly well known for specialty coffee. So this is kind of a neat project. Nice. Yeah. How many coffee, different coffee beans do you carry at your shop? So um, I'm what they refer to as a multi-roaster. And I bring in um, coffee from maybe three or four roasters at a time. Um, and probably a dozen or more roasters throughout the year I probably source from. And I'm often searching for new ones. And in a lot of cases, some of the roasters are providing really unique coffees that are particularly rare or processed in a really unique way. I'm not just sourcing from um, roasters here in Canada. I'm abroad in places in uh, like Scandinavian countries like Norway and Sweden and down in Australia. So. Okay. Yeah. When it comes to going into a cafe and getting your coffee, what is the factor between a person and a machine that affects how good your coffee is? So both can have an impact. And the machine, it's, it's a few variables that matter. And they're not that challenging to acquire. They're just expensive. That's usually the biggest challenge with them. Um, so a machine with reliable temperature stability is pretty much the name of the game for being able to produce consistent, repeatable, good coffee. Um, if you have that, then diligence to a good protocol on making the coffee is actually pretty straightforward. A lot of people give me a lot of credit for being, you know, better than somebody else or, you know, being able to make better coffee than other places or whatever it is. And I'm like, well, I could show just about anybody how to do this. Whether or not they can handle a busy lineup of people and somebody getting mad at them for getting something wrong or whatever multitude of things that happens throughout a day that and still be able to consistently produce good coffee, that's a little more challenging. Well, it smells so good in here, so I'm really excited for our coffee. I'm hoping you can hook me up. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Awesome. So while he works on my delicious coffee, make sure you stay tuned. Up next, we're going to visit Cornucopia Food and Wine Festival in Whistler after the break. Every November, people flock to Whistler for Cornucopia, an annual celebration all about food and wine that lasts for 10 days. November is the perfect time to have a festival like this. It's mostly raining in the village, it's early in the season, so we don't mind. We're gonna head in to Cornucopia and chat to some of the locals involved. I'm inside the Whistler Conference Center, and just behind me through these doors is the Culinary Stage Series for Cornucopia. So the Culinary Stage Experience, it's set up so that people can come out and learn from and taste with amazing chefs from all over. And I'm here with one of our local chefs from Lillooet. This is Chef Dylan. Welcome, Chef Dylan. Thank you very much, Chrissy. So why don't you tell us about your restaurant up in Lillooet? In Lillooet, we run a restaurant out of the kitchen at the Fort Barron's Estate Winery where we focus on local cuisine. We supply from about seven different purveyors in the area and my personal goal is that 90% of our product is grown within 20 kilometers of our restaurant. That's so great. So locally sourced ingredients, what are we talking here? What kind of ingredients are you using? The ingredients vary quite a bit throughout the season. We are subject to seasonality. My favorite thing about cooking in Lillooet is the hot weather ingredients. We get melons and tomatoes Thanks. that you just cannot believe. I mm -hmm. buy forged berries and a variety of herbs and different mm -hmm. tubers and potatoes and pretty much anything that you would expect to grow can grow and it grows very well under a big sky with lots of sun and mm -hmm. an immense amount of water coming off the glaciers. Awesome. Um, what about meats? I think you source some of your local meats through a, a farmer that you have a relationship with? Yeah, we source local meats from f three different farms in the area. Um, the farm in, that we're specifically talking about would be the Spray Creek Ranch. Mm -hmm. It's owned and operated by Tristan and Aubin Banwell. They are certified organic and their goal is to have all of their animals born, raised, finished, slaughtered, and butchered on the property. At this point in time, they've reached to that third step, and within the 12 months, their goal is to have a fully licensed abattoir and butcher shop on the property. Mm -hmm. So everything coming out of your kitchen at Lillooet is so fresh and local, I love it. It's great. It's been a, a goal of mine for a very long time, and it's a lot fantastic. of hard work has come to a culmination. So tell us about the event today. We're here at Cornucopia. You've got, uh, you're gonna take the stage at the Culinary Stage Series in just a little bit. So why don't you tell us a bit about that? The event today is a fun one. We've deemed it the chef, the winemaker, and the farmer. So we have 
our winemaker, Danny, and he's going to talk about viticulture in our area and the wines that we're pouring. And Tristan from Spray Creek is here as well. He's a very knowledgeable individual and he'll share lots of important details about growth of agriculture in our region, sustainable agriculture, our goals to cater to the Sea to Sky Corridor, and his very specific and refined forms of animal husbandry. Mm -hmm. And what about what you're going to be cooking today? Is there a dish that you're really passionate about that you're excited for people to try today? We're cooking three courses today and I'm most excited about the third course, the main course. I'm trying to draw attention away from always focusing on a prime cut of meat. Mm -hmm. So today's main course is a carrot steak mm -hmm. served with braised veal, wild rice, roasted kabocha squash and a carrot puree. So what else are you cooking today? Just because I love food and I'm interested. Our first course is a grilled cheese with farmhouse chef, a Bing cherry and Cabernet Franc compote. And our second course is spetzli served with a spruce tip and pine mushroom cream sauce. Mm, my mouth is watering. Mine too. <laughs> the smell that comes off of the second course is lovely. I imagine. Yeah. Well, we're really excited to um, follow you around today and get some, some fun um, experience with you up on the culinary stage. I think it's gonna be great. Um, anything else you're gonna be attending here at Cornucopia? Uh, we've attended two events with the kitchen. We've attended Cellar Door and Crush, and this will be our third, and we'll be heading home after this. All right. Well, we're so glad that you're in Whistler representing um, the kitchen at Fort Barron's Winery, and I know you have a ton to do, so I'm going to let you get back to work. My pleasure. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Stay tuned, because coming up next, I'm going to be talking with the winemaker from Fort Barron's Winery in Lillooet, and that's coming up after the break. Did you know that Lillooet is fast becoming a destination for wine exploration? There's a beautiful winery that's perched on sagebrush benchlands alongside the Fraser River with towering mountains right above it. And I feel that Fort Barrens has really embraced the spirit of Lillooet. And I'm here now with the winemaker from Fort Barrens Winery. This is Danny Hutting. And thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me on this. Yeah, we're here in Cornucopia. There's an abundance of wine coming around, um, but we've got some beautiful Fort Barron wine mm -hmm. here to taste today. Um, but first of all, I'm very curious to know what are the challenges and wins that you have making wine up in Lillooet? Well, um, as far as challenges go, I would say the first thing that comes to mind is that uh, being that it is a new wine growing region, we have, um, uh, there are no set standards for um, uh, 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 practicing viticulture or uh, implementing winemaking techniques. So uh, we as pioneers have to have uh, developed all of these practices and indeed also determine which varieties work best in our, in our region. That would be the first challenge. I, see, I think the second challenge is finding enough locally produced grapes to supplement our production needs. Um, indeed, we are working with a couple of prospective growers and a couple of uh, prospective investors in establishing new vineyards in and around our area. And uh, hopefully five years down the line, we have enough uh, locally produced um, grapes to uh, feed our needs. And mm. what is making it work in Lillooet in terms of growing grapes for wine? Well, Lillooet has a very unique um, a, a climate. It is uh, very hot in the summers and indeed it's also very dry. These are two very important factors for uh, growing grapes and growing quality grapes at that. Um, as thirdly, I would say that uh, we have a very reliable water source. We have the Fraser River, which runs right through our little town, and it uh, um, supplies ample water for irrigation throughout the season. And lastly, uh, we have a lot of arable land, and that is still very affordable. So um, people can, uh, or potential investors can come there, they can buy the land, they can establish vineyard, and it's not going to cost them an arm and a leg. Okay. Mm. And what about the rest of the Sea to Sky? We're not seeing any wineries in Whistler or Squamish. Mm -hmm. What's your thoughts on that? How come we're not seeing more wine making happening in this area? Yeah, so um, uh, grapes require a certain climate in order to thrive in. First of all, it needs to be warm and it needs to be dry, neither of which Squamish or uh, Whistler <laughs> are particularly known Fair for. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, indeed, you could grow grapes here. I'm not saying that, that they wouldn't, but I don't necessarily think that you would um, uh, produce uh, quality grapes year in, year out. And which varietals are you having success with? What are your more popular wines? Well, we have proven um, as pioneers in Lillooet that we can grow uh, some of the big varieties. We can grow Cabernet Franc, we can grow Merlot. Um, these two varieties have been doing really, really well. And indeed also our, our Riesling. Year in, year out, we're producing consistent quality um, and also uh, consistent yields. So um, as far as uh, the best varieties for our region, or at least that we have experimented with, 
I would say Cabernet Franc and Rieslings are the ones to look out for. Okay, and what do you have for us today? I see that you've brought some wine. Yeah, I've brought um, <laughs> two wines for us to taste. Um, uh, very aptly, I brought our um, 2016 uh, Riesling. Um, our 2016 Riesling is one of the um, uh, top 25 wines for Cornucopia. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to taste this with you first. Mm -hmm. um, it is a very uh, true expression of what Lillouette uh, tastes like. Um, there are mm -hmm. aromas of um, a tropical fruit, uh, passion mm -hmm. fruit in particular on the nose. Um, wow. And then it has a, a slight nuance of uh, kerosene, which believe it or not is a, a desirable uh -huh. quality in, in, in Riesling. Um, mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, it sort of uh, jumps, out, jumps out at you. Um, and then um, it's, a, it's a very food friendly wine. Mm -hmm. it has what a, would you pair it with? Well, I would pair it with the spicy foods mainly. Mm -hmm. it, has a, it has a little bit of residual sugar and that residual sugar is there just to sort of cut right through the, the racy acidity. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I say spicy food because it really holds up against the, you know, intense foods like, uh, like spicy ties and, and what okay. have you. Um, it has the acidity, it has the sweetness and it also has the bouquet to, um, to really stand up to, to very big wines. All and right. then on the palate, You'll notice a, a chalkiness, and that again just um, adds to the, the the structure of the of the mm -hmm. overall wine. I feel like a like a butter chicken or something mm -hmm. like that would be that amazing. Would totally work. Okay, awesome. wow, yeah, that so was delightful. This is our 2016 <laughs> uh, Riesling. Very nice. Cheers. And then Cheers. Um, next up we have. Um, our ultra premium red. This is mm -hmm. called our red gold. It is red gold. A, yes, it's a red gold. Um, we produce about 200 cases um, of this um, every year, so it's uh, mm -hmm. it's quite exclusive. Um, it is a Meritage blend, and it consists out of three varieties: Cabernet Franc, Cabernet Sauvignon, and Merlot. Mm -hmm. And our Mer Meritage is unique because we use an Apesamento style to ferment or to um, uh, uh, prepare our Cabernet Franc grapes. Apesamento is when um, we uh, uh, harvest the grapes towards the end of uh, crush, mm -hmm. and uh, we let it dry in a commercial dryer for about a month. So during this time, uh, the grapes lo lose about 30% of their moisture, intensifying the, the aromas and the sugars mm -hmm. in the berries. We then take those grapes and we uh, ferment them mm -hmm. in, in open top barrels, mm -hmm. and um, it makes up about 45% uh, of our, our Meritage blend. Really, it's the, the mm -hmm. one technique that sets our, our Meritage And what would you those. pair this one with? Mm -hmm. I would pair this um, with, uh, with more hearty foods, um, perhaps a big old steak and uh, <laughs> yeah, <I could> see <laughs> some that. meaty dishes. Mm -hmm. it's a, Just it, by the smell. <laughs> it's, it's a big wine. And it's a big it, wine, it, yeah. It, 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 can take, it can take a lot. All right, let's give it a go. Wow, that's spectacular. Big and bold. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love it. Cheers. Well, thank you so much for bringing these for awesome. us to taste today. You you're made welcome. my day. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you're racing off to also um, attend the Culinary Stage Series with Chef Dylan. That's right. We um, are... So good luck with that. Thank you so much. And um, just a note too, if you're ever passing through Lillouette, first of all, it's a gorgeous drive just to get up there. And then once you're up there, this beautiful winery perched right up there on the bench lands. Um, it's a stunning place and with stunning wines as well. So make sure you pop in and say hello to winemaker Danny. A warm drink, a tasty meal, and a delightful glass of wine. I don't know about you, but these are all things that make me so happy. We hope you enjoyed today's show. If you're looking to watch more videos like this, you can check out our YouTube or Facebook page. And remember to get out there and try some of the tasty treats where you live.